Hello, everyone. Before we dive into this week's episode, I just want to share something with you that's coming up soon here at The Real Life Process. One of the things we do here at The Real Life Process is to certify other coaches with the content that we have here at The Process, a tool that you can put into your tool belt. So if you're growing a thriving coaching business and you would like a proven faith-based coaching framework, check out our next cohort. Just go to therealliferocess.com and click on Get Certified. The next cohort starts on July 15th. We only do 12 people in each cohort. So we would love to invite you to check out the Real Life Process Certification Program and see if it might be a great fit for you as a tool in your tool belt as a coach. Welcome back, friends, to the Doing What Matters podcast. I am so grateful to be here with you on this episode, and I want to dive into a topic that I'm asked about so often because one of the things I love to do is host events, and we just got done hosting our certified coaches here in my hometown, Effingham, Illinois, where I live. And we just hosted them for a three-day in-person retreat is what we call it. We actually host these twice a year for our network of certified coaches. And these are people that some of them have known each other for several years now. Some of them are brand new into our program, but we come together for three days at a time, a couple of times of the year, once in the spring and once in the fall. And as I host these events, we've actually learned to do them fairly well, if I do say so myself. It's something that I love to do, but there are about 10 things that I have learned that I think might be helpful for you if you are thinking about hosting some in-person events, either for the business that you have or for a community, or you really want to just host events, retreats, conferences, whatever, as a revenue stream uh, in your business. I just think it's so fun to get people together in person. But let me share with you these 10 things. These aren't the all exhaustive list, but I think this is a great place for you to start and things for you to consider as you think about hosting an event. First of all, let me start with the very first one. If you're going to deliver content, in other words, you're going to teach them or train them on something, make sure that you stay with one theme or one big learning takeaway. Before you ever start the event, think about when someone walks away a week from now, what will I want them to have remembered that they learn? And try to stick with one theme. I'll give you an example for our last event that we just did a couple weeks ago. The theme was foundations, having solid foundations. And I wanted the people to walk away with confidence and with clarity and with connection. So connection to others, I know that helps them have a solid foundation. Confidence in the work that they were going to do with the content that they have here at the Real Life Process. So my theme was solid foundation. So that was the first thing is what's the learning that you want them to walk away with? How do you want them to feel when they're on the plane ride home or in the car driving home or even a week later when they're reflecting back? What's the one idea that they're going to walk away with? And then I love, and this is just something I love to do. It's not, you have to do it this way, but I love to give them something visual that I teach with as a concept and maybe even send them home with something that's a visual. Two years ago, I actually sent them home with a packet of seeds as we were talking about growing something. And so my whole opening talk was around growth and seeds, and they went home with a package of seeds. This year for Solid Foundation, I'm like, this is a little bit harder, but I actually ended up using Legos to demonstrate how our process that they work with 
actually helped someone to build a solid foundation in their life. And I wrote on each of the Legos and then they could take home a Lego that they actually wrote on as well. So what's a visual concept, something that they can tape home, travel with easily that you might be able to give them that's around the theme or the big learning. I just think it makes it fun and another way to tuck that learning into their brain by something tangible that they can hold on to and uh, that they can carry home and it might be fun and memorable. They might keep it out for a while so it reminds them of the event. So that's the first two things. The third thing starts with kind of the behind the scenes of putting on the event and that is to delegate, delegate. I can't say it enough, delegate. If you don't have a team that works with you, if you don't have contractors, employees, then you may actually want to hire someone specifically to help you to put on the event. Now, I have done this the hard way and hosted and done everything myself, and I do not recommend it because you will be tired enough at the end of any event that you have without trying to do it all yourself. So delegate things like the food, getting the food ordered, getting it catered in, making sure it's delivered on time. Things like swag. Maybe you're going to give away something. You're going to have a little swag bag for them that can be ordered ahead of time and put together by someone other than you. The setup of the room and the teardown of the room, if you're going to be using a room. Hosting, someone being the hostess in the room, making sure that things are cleaned up and straightened up at the end of the day, greeting people when they come in, having name tags maybe for them to put on, all that kind of thing. That is delegating. So make a list of all the things and then delegate out as much as you possibly can especially if you're going to be the main presenter at the event, you're going to have enough to do without having to think about all those things. And so let me give you this other tip. This is 3.5 because it just reminded me when I said to delegate and that if you don't, you're going to be tired. Make sure that you do not schedule anything for the day after the event. So if your event ends on a Saturday, make sure you're taking that Sunday off as a day of rest. Even if you still have things to put away, things to do on Monday, take off the Sunday as a day of rest. You might even want to take off the Sunday and the Monday as a day of rest to just recharge your battery. So that's 3.5 in the list. So number four is if you can, and you might need to hire this, you might need to just ask a friend or someone in your circle or someone from the event to be the MC or the facilitator of the event. What I mean by that is they're actually kicking off and welcoming everyone into the room and getting their attention and doing those types of things. They're following the schedule, helping to keep you on schedule. We actually use a great big clock in the back of our event called a time timer it's a a kid's clock that counts down the minutes so that I can visually see or anyone else that's presenting at the front of the room can see how much time they have left. That's something the MC or the facilitator can do. They're just very aware of what's going on in the room and they know how to keep things moving and they keep you moving as well and keep you on time as well, getting the next thing done getting maybe slide decks set up, taking care of some of the technology if you have that. But having that MC or facilitator that's partnering with you that people see at the front of the room is a key part to me to hosting a good event. Another thing that MC or facilitator can do that I think is really cool, and this is something that the girl that partners with me does and that we've been doing for several years is They are listening throughout the entire event for key moments and key takeaways that people have had, quotes that they've said, things that have been shared. And a great thing to do is wrap that all together and do a reflection back at the end of the event. It really is meaningful for people to go, oh, yes, I forgot we learned that. Or I remember when this person said that everybody in the room 
it was an aha moment or it was a funny moment, whatever it is, they're just capturing those extraordinary moments and they're giving them back to everyone in attendance as just a great memory and a great wrap up. So that's another thing that MC or facilitator can do. The fifth thing is, and I just did this for the first time at this event and it was a huge hit and I probably will do it at every event that we have from now on. And that is having a place specifically for people to take pictures. People love to take pictures as a memory of coming to something. They love to take pictures of themselves. They love to take pictures together with others. You'll probably want to take a group picture of everyone at your event. So having a place that's specific, possibly branded to your brand, if you have a brand, to take pictures is great for your exposure on social media and for their exposure on social media. They love to show other people where they've been and what they're doing, and especially if it's a business-related event. Even if it's not, it shows off your brand and the events that you host, and it might encourage others to sign up and come to one of your events. So have a place specific. You don't have to spend a lot of money on this, but and you can announce it. Your MC can announce it at the beginning of over here. We have a place for you specifically to take pictures. Make sure that you tag us, tell them what the tag is those types of things. And they will gravitate towards that place. We had so much fun with that at our event this year. The next thing is, as you think about the flow of the event, is give time within the delivery of your content and delivery of that big learning and takeaway for people to have table talk time. And what I mean by this is time for them to reflect back for two or three or four minutes at the end of anything that you teach or deliver or content that you give. When people can reflect back their learning from the notes they just took or for what they remember, it goes deeper into their brain and it becomes more applicable and actionable to them. And it also helps them to develop relationships with others in the room. Remember, one of my takeaways is always connection at any of my events. So giving them that ability to talk to one another, not just at times of breaks, but in other times is something that we've learned over time that is really a huge takeaway for people. So some way of table talk time. Now, I personally prefer if I'm going to have to be in a room, that it's round tables, not set up in a U shape or whatever, so that people can easily gather four to five people, six people at the most around a table. I try to take away chairs. I don't want eight people at a table. That's too many for share time. So just think about that, of you know how you get people to sit in these groups so that they can have table talk time and arranging the room that way. The next one is, Give lots of free time or downtime. We normally try to end our days at 3 to 3.30. We may start anywhere from 8.30 to 9, and we end at 3 or 3.30 so that people have two to three hours of break before we come back for dinner and that people can feel like uh, we try to do at least one night that is on their own. We tell people where we're going and what we're going to be doing where we might be eating dinner that night, but that they're not required to come. Remember, just because your personality might be high energy, not everybody is. And it's a lot for people to travel, for people to take in. So making even the first night of your event maybe a little shorter, earlier night as you gather them in so that if people want to go back and get a good night's rest, they can. But then also thinking about one evening being a free evening. If they want to join the group, they can if they don't have to. But it's also helping you to pace yourself as well as the host and for your team to pace themselves so that it doesn't feel like it's just go, go, go all the time. People can only absorb so much information and they're never going to feel if you pace it, they are not going to feel that you cheated them by not giving them enough. I can tell you most of us over deliver at these types of events because we just want to put so much in and we actually make it too hard on people to absorb all the things. So give lots of free time or downtime. 
yeah, that will just help you so much in getting some great reviews. The other thing that we've learned over time is to provide a schedule for people. It doesn't have to be to the minute, but you can have the minute down to the minute details for you and your team and those that are presenting and that type of thing. But for everyone else, just some general, like morning session, afternoon session, what time is lunch going to be? Maybe when the breaks are going to be, that type of thing is really helpful for people. You have to remember that people that are coming to some of your events might be a little fearful of what's going to happen. When are we going to be done for the day? When would I be able to call home? If I have to take a call or have to step out of the room for a bit, when's going to be a good time for me to do that? Giving people that overall schedule is helpful. Another thing that we try to do along this line is give them some ideas of where they can eat, where they might get a cup of coffee, what is happening in the area that you are hosting the event in, where could they eat if they are need to run out and get a bite to eat, what, where could those things happen? Most of your Chamber of Commerces will actually provide you a little travel guide, and they're more than happy to have that little advertisement booklet that you can put in your swag bag or whatever. So if you're hosting it at a place where people are going to be coming and going with their own cars and might need to stop at other places or pick up things, think about those types of things. We even provide for people many times when church services are, if we're going to be over a weekend and we know that we have people that will be wanting to attend worship, we'll let them know what different denominations, where what those church times are or where the nearest Walgreens is to pick up medicine or something like that. The more helpful things like that, that you can provide in a travel guide, if you host events often in the same location, you can use that over and over again. The last couple of things I would share is a really important one is to get them outdoors, get them moving. In that break that you might have in the afternoon, you might invite them to go walk on a trail or go to a nearby park or whatever uh, might be around you that you can get them outside and get them moving. We need to move our bodies. And when you give people an opportunity to do that, they can come back refreshed. So just look around at where you're hosting the event and say, what could you offer people to get them outside and get them moving and tell them where they might be able to go and do that during one of your longer breaks. And then the very last thing I would say is follow up with a survey or a feedback form within a couple of days while it's still fresh in their minds. We have learned so many things about how to put on a good event because of the surveys and the follow-ups. If you wait a whole week, people have forgotten. They have moved on. You can do that on something as simple as a Google form. You can use something like JotForm or some of your survey apps. But just give them four to five questions where they can give you some feedback. People are more than happy, especially if they're part of your community or they know they might do another event with you, to let you know things. We have learned so much from our surveys and feedback forms as to the food they enjoyed, the places they liked to eat, whether it was too much content or not enough. So many of these 10 things that I have shared with you, we've learned by trial and error from surveying our people and learning from our communities. So those are the top 10 things that I would tell you, I could tell you so much more but these are the things that I think are the highlights of how to host a great in-person event for your community or for a way to ge generate revenue and some of the things that you might think about. So I hope you've enjoyed just learning this episode and just leaning in. And I just want to challenge you, go out and build community, create events. We are such a lonely group of people who are dying to be together in person and face to face. And I think you would be great at hosting an event. One of the things I love about do these types of things is how many extraordinary moments they create. How many times people will walk away or they'll send me an email or they'll thank me after the event to just say that it was a life-changing thing for them, that they learned so much. 
So I just want to challenge you in that. Go host your first event. Have a great time. And remember that every ordinary day has an extraordinary moment. You just have to look for them. And maybe they're going to take place at your very next event. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Doing What Matters podcast. And I can't wait to hear all about your in-person event.